Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you all. I am Brian Crimmins, as mentioned. My pronouns are he, him. I am on a really good day, 5'11". That's... I've got brown hair that is normally extremely curly, but this morning it's being held down by a pretty good amount of gel to make sure it looks presentable for all of you. And it's a pleasure to be here, as mentioned, um, the CEO of Changing Our World. And I had the opportunity about eight or so years ago, maybe even more, to meet Nathan and to go on a journey I had no idea we were going to go on together, meaning starting off as uh, he was a client, we had the typical client-consultant relationship. But when it was very quickly that, at least from my perspective, we would spend hours talking about the work he was doing at City of Hope and trying to figure out how we could improve the great work that they do. And it was one of those relationships from very early on that I found myself saying to him, what are you doing after work? Do uh, you want to keep this conversation going? And it was really from that that we both had, I know I can speak for him when I say this, we both had a concern about our sector and what some of the data that we were tracking was telling us. And we were worried about the sector so much so that we before COVID, we're at various conferences like this together and, and asking audiences, and in a sense, at times begging other people to write the book, to write the book on this. And lo and behold, when COVID hit, and I think we both realized we weren't going to be on the road as much, uh, we decided we'll probably never have another time like this to put our heads together and, and to put this book out into the, into the ecosystem of our not-for-profit community uh, to hope, hopefully inspire some conversations and to really inspire hope. Um, we've been told by people who've read the book, and I won't take a poll of who's had a chance to read it yet, but we've been told by those who've read it that if you can get through the first 100 pages, it actually is a book of hope. <laughs> it's a book of hopefully inspiring all of us to think about the work we do every day. Uh, it's so critical to our society at large. Um, but it definitely, we, we felt we had to ring the bell. We felt we had to draw attention to what we're going to take you through the highlights of that today. So thank you this, again this morning for, for being with us. And we hope that this conversation that we'll lead through and hopefully have time for Q&A afterwards will just inspire and maybe open your eyes to some of the things that we saw as we were doing our research for this book. So uh, as we've been going around the country, uh, doing con uh, speaking at conferences just like this, we've just been humbled by a few things I just want to touch on. One is when we were working with our, um, our production company and the, the, the book company that we were working with, Wiley, that, you know, one of the things they asked us right from the beginning was what, was, what does success look like for you all? Like, why are you writing this book? And for me, I, I know one of the things I said right away um, was if, if there were book clubs that eventually formed around this book and enabled people to have conversations and think about doing their jobs differently, to me, that would be amazing. That would be a home run. Um, to, to me, that means that people on the front lines who do the work that we've all done, that you all do every day, are really taking this to heart. And I think the response has been very positive, um, but that's okay. You know, we, we often say we, don't, we didn't write a book called The Generosity Crisis to make a lot of friends. So if it means it just opened up a, a debate and a conversation for the better, better of, our, of our sector, well, then that was our goal as well. And so we've been humbled by the response, but we also know it can go you know, certainly both ways. Let me start by grounding you in something you already know, and, and that is that the not-for-profit community, the community that we all work in every day, is so unique to our country. I'm fortunate enough to travel the world and not only advise, but also speak and whenever I am outside of the United States, there's a, there's a yearning to really understand our development as a sector, really understand the trajectory that we've been on. It's, it's fascinating to watch different companies and different cult, uh, countries and different cultures really evolve their own philanthropic priorities, their own social impact sector. And obviously, there's different tax laws and different ways it's evolving in different countries. But they always are curious and really look to all of you who do the work that you do to really get some inspiration and some wisdom from it. But it's, it's no doubt that the, the not-for-profit sector in our country is a really, really important part of our society. I mean, the numbers speak it. So we've got 10 million not-for-profits globally, 1.6 million in the United States. 12 million people are in this country are employed uh, by a not-for-profit. 
It, we, the not-for-profit community, represent about 5.7% of the U.S. economy. So we are, we are a massive part of what makes this country unique, but also what makes this country go. And if you're familiar at all with Peter Drucker, uh, the management guru, who obviously is no longer with us, but he wrote some fascinating books about management for companies, but he also wrote a lot about the not-for-profit community. And to me, this is one of my favorite quotes where he talks about wh how critical and how important the not-for-profit community is, referring to it not being a business that sells products or not being a government that puts controls in place, but really the byproduct of the success of a not-for-profit is a changed human being. And I think that's a really important thing, but it's also a, an important grounding thing for myself to talk about the health of our sector going forward. Um, I, I need to introduce myself as well because Brian's taken up all the airspace so far. I am, <laughs> I'm Nathan. I, uh, my pronouns I identify with are he, him, his. I am 5'10". I would say that my hair was blonde where it used to be, but now I have to admit it's just gray. And I'm wearing a tan or brown blazer and clear glasses. It's great to be here this morning. And we are, um, as Brian was saying, we're going to guide you through. It kind of feels like the airplane is, is going to be like, you know, nose diving for a little while. But like our book, we actually like pull that out. And toward the end of this presentation, we're going to provide um, a sense of hope and some practical application of, of what we need to do in our sector. So essentially, you know, all our sector is so unique in the sense that we have so many people that are that come to work every day committed to, to doing something beyond themselves, something that neither they or the organization could do alone. And it truly is a, a, a unique space that's often greatly, greatly misunderstood by the private sector and by others that don't participate. Uh, back when I was at CCS, actually, this is um, where my journey in essentially understanding what was going on with Giving USA and and reading reports year over year, I was this total nerd kid that would get the Giving USA report. I'd block off my entire calendar for the whole day, and I would not just read the report, but I'd read the footnotes of the report. And it was honestly through reading the footnotes that I realized that while philanthropy was continuing to reach all-time high almost every year at 2.1% of the GDP, that there was this underpinning that was happening. Essentially, who was filling the bucket was changing. And we found this out by looking at these footnotes, and these footnotes were saying that every year ultra high net worth gifts are being subtracted by the total because they were actually influencing the, the total report. And so started tracking this year over year and realizing more and more of these ultra high net worth gifts, and this year a mega gift is considered $500 million or more. The Giving USA report comes out next Tuesday. You should all pay very, very close attention. While I can't say um, too much about it right now, um, I think a lot of what we'll share will, will sound familiar. Uh, at the end of the day, um, we are, when I was at CCS, I had to present or actually prepare a, an analysis to present back to our fellow colleagues. And, and I did this by looking at a few things. I was looking at, in 2010, the Giving Pledge was created by Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. And so on one end, we could have thought, wow, philanthropy is going to be at an all-time high. Since Rockefeller and Carnegie, philanthropy had not been, as, from a media perspective, as in vogue in almost 100 years. So we thought, well, this could be amazing for the world of philanthropy that we are going to elevate what we do and it is just going to make, uh, you know, convince or, or really inspire other people to give. The other side of that coin was, what if that creates what we call now really the crowding out effect? What if because Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and others give, you know, these very large gifts, do other people essentially feel that maybe their gifts are not as needed. And so it just started the inquiry, and we'll get into many more reasons and the confluence of factors of why there is a generosity crisis. But at this point, we, we, this body of work that we'll share with you is really about 10 years in the making. At this point, we have to actually use someone else's words and not our words. Brian and I have been talking about this truly like not making a lot of friends. Like we were talking about this for several years, and like people leave the room when we'd come in because they're like, oh, there's the Speak doomsday. For yeah, the doomsday or, you know, philanthropy guys. And even at the, at the largest circles, like at the Giving Institute, you know, it just was not a popular thing because who wants to pay a consultant to tell you bad news? Really, no one. You want to tell people, like, philanthropy is thriving and we're going to help you get your fair share. And so we really, I think, broken the ice to say, you know what, something is fundamentally changing in our industry and we need to pay attention. And so 
this quote came out and a group called the Generosity Commission was formed a few years ago by a few individuals of uh, Giving Institute and that self-funded and, and raised money to fund essentially modern day research on the effect of charitable giving. And their reports are just concluding and they'll actually be uh, releasing their reports. A few of them already been released, but a body of their work will be released this summer. And so essentially it's like, okay, there is an issue. How pervasive is the issue and what can we do about it? And by the way, that statement should make all of the hair on your neck go up, like which I, when I first read it, I thought, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when we're talking about something that has been part of American society, this act of generosity since Alexis de Tocqueville came to the U.S. and wrote extensively on the commitment to community that people in the U.S. had that other countries didn't have, we take so much for granted. We live in a, in a society that is really powered by philanthropy and charity and and goodwill, and essentially what we're gonna be talking about is that is essentially at risk. And so, <clears throat> practically speaking, the chart, which might be tough to see with the colors we used here, um, is tracking the percentage of households who contribute to a not-for-profit from uh, 2000 to 2018. And what you'll see, it's a downward trajectory if you cannot see it well, and it's continuing downward. Uh, what really happened was it was starting to go down, and then the financial crisis of 08, 09 happened. And kudos to the Chronicle of Philanthropy. They wrote in 2017, looking at 2015 data, uh, and that's a cover article of their what, uh, how America really gives. They were the ones who started ringing the bell then, saying something fundamentally happened during the financial crisis, which the habit, if you will, of people's uh, households supporting not-for-profits does not appear to be recovering. And so we've been on this downward trajectory, and they were right. This past July, almost a year ago, they came out with their giving crisis, uh, once again ringing the bell, but also talking in it, if you have not read the July 2022 article, they have great case studies of, of not-for-profits and individuals who are starting to change the curve, change the narrative within their not-for-profit. But we've been on this downward trajectory where at one point it was 66, 67% of households that were supporting a not-for-profit, and the last data point on that it was at below 50, 49.6%. And so we just don't know exactly where the bottom is yet, but unfortunately we're, we're heading in a continued downward trajectory. Um, and that for us is really concerning. You know, something which we're gonna touch on for us, something was happening that we needed to really pay attention to. And as with anything I think in life, it's not one factor, it's actually a confluence of factors that were causing this environment and this challenge for many of the not-for-profits. And when we drew the line down on the trajectory that it's on, and we thought to ourselves, if left unchecked, if there was no strategies to, to change the trajectory, believe it or not, the trajectory is such that in 49 years, giving would cease to, cease to exist in this country. 49 years. Now, I know I can speak for Nathan on this as well. Do I think that's gonna happen? Absolutely not. But as I said a few minutes ago, but where is the bottom? We all don't know that, to be very candid. And so we're trying to begin to talk and, as I said, raise the awareness of this so that we can begin to get to the solutions. And so, and I just talked about Giving USA. You know, one of the things that we wanted to also share is, while our book was written last year, the current data continues to reinforce this generosity crisis. Essentially, this is data from the Fundraising Effectiveness Project in uh, whatever last year was, 2022, time flies. Um, in Q4, and something happened in Q4 that had not happened, in, happened since 2012, which is while we saw that remarkable decline in the number of households that are giving, for the first time since 2012, we actually saw a decrease in dollars as well. And so, you know, we'll get in d deeply into the different um, aspects that are leading to this, but wanted to actually share. One of the things we also know is that uh, ultra high net worth individuals who are now making up a bigger um, part of the, the pie, if you will, are also have the best lens of what the future looks like. I mean, they have lots of economic advisors and corporations have lots of people that tell them, hey, you need to hold back now because things are gonna be, get rough. And so if we think about, you know, even the Mackenzie Scotts of the world where she's given to 3,400 organizations, one-tenth of 1% 1 of nonprofits actually will benefit from her or have benefited from her generosity. So this idea that many nonprofits are just saying, well, that's, that's for them, we're just gonna compete for higher average dollars and ultra high net worth individuals, 
know that that's not a very sustainable strategy. And also for the first time, the number of, of uh, high net worth individuals that signed the giving pledge last year reduced in half. And so this idea of like, well, what's going on? I might not want to commit to this because things look weird. I'll, I'll wait and kind of wait it out and see what happens on the other end. And so that's kind of the thing with any time you're putting a lot of eggs in a very few baskets that you have to run this risk of saying, okay, well, how much liability do we have in saying that is how philanthropy is funded? How big can the course correction be? All right, so here we get into really the heart, the, the heart of our book, which is again, this idea of understanding all of these things that we've talked about so far are just a few instances, ultra high net worth gifts and um, other declines. But really when we, we are always asked this question, first is, is there a generosity crisis? And we, the data in the first 100 pages proves that there is. But the second is, well, did we do this to ourselves or has it been done to us? Are nonprofits a victim or the culprit? And the answer, and this is a majority of our research and, and work together, is absolutely yes. I'll, I'll take the first slide, which is um, just essentially a snapshot of what we get into the book. What we really think about this is saying that this is, the generosity crisis is a culmination of lots of different things all happening kind of at the same time. And so when we think about this idea of the culprit, I'm not gonna spend too much time because we definitely wanna lead, uh, leave time for some Q&A at the end. But really the one that gets me is spending, I spent 20 years in fundraising. I, um, from very small organizations like Boys and Girls Club to very large organizations like City of Hope and UC San Diego. And at the end of the day, I was essentially the one that was saying, because I believe this, is that we have to acquire more donors every year, otherwise we're gonna lose a footing. And essentially, you know, this does it, like unquenchable desire to uh, acquire more donors has actually become a very, very bad practice in our industry. It's actually led us to essentially making giving highly transactional to the point where it's just to acquire and to lose, to acquire and to lose. The, the average retention for an acquired donor is 19 to 21%. Overall in our industry, a donor retention is around 39 to 40% at this point. That is not a sustainable business. So this idea that down at the bottom is this belief that more is better is something that fundamentally we have to shift in our thinking. And this is where I love to have, I would say, arguments but heated conversations with other CDOs that have not seen how, you know, spending, you know, $200 to acquire a donor that's going to, you know, not stay with you for more than a year versus this idea of cultivating better donors, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but this idea that better donors have an average uh, lifetime value of 15x. So a lot of what we're going to say today is going to sound very familiar in the sense of like, People say, well, it sounds like good old fashioned major gift work. Before we made giving so transactional and that we were just had this desire to acquire, acquire, acquire. When I started in fundraising, before GuideStar, I'm old, it, it was very relational. People gave to our organization because they trusted me, they trusted our, the history of our organization, they, they had to. So I had the only way to build that trust was to actually get to know people personally. And so this is really a calling for um, in our entire book is actually calling for uh, the idea of less is more. I will say, any of you that would like to have more conversation about the other aspects, we just don't have time today, we're always happy to um, go deeper as well. So the question, victim or the, the culprit, you know, the, the thing to really keep in mind, and this is where we've gotten a lot of reaction, because we'll, sometimes we'll do these talks and then have workshops, a lot of it's on this too, which is the culprit side of things, which is there's no doubt and we are not immune. Every sector, I mean, look at the retail sector right now, is under tremendous strain and change. Um, but he, and again, we cover a lot of this in the book, but there's just a few that I want to point out. One is, it, we have a, a world right now, if you look at the research on happiness and trust, both are declining at rapid rates. Decline of happiness and trust within, with each other, with organizations. Well, that I, that just creates an environment as, when you're raising funds. If trust and happiness are at all-time lows, it's just going to be very difficult in general. I think we talk about the crowding out effect. We talk about the overwhelming amount of communication that's out there. So as you and your not-for-profit put out your incredible missions, we're looking at the average person getting 333 emails a day, the average person seeing between five and 10,000 ads in a day. We just have tremendous amount of information coming at us and an environment, as I said, of decreasing happiness and trust. The middle bottom is the one that I want to spend a few more slides on, a few more minutes on. And this, it's this notion of the competition for connection. 
that we, that we really putting our heads together and writing this book. That's the aha that we had, which is that you as not-for-profits are no longer just competing with other not-for-profits. In fact, you're competing with the whole universe to get our attention, to get our mind share, our relationships, and ultimately, hopefully, our commitment and our financial resources to it. So to start this notion of the competition for connection, let's also just look at it from us as people and understand our own ability to pay attention and to concentrate. And it was founded that in two, it was studied that in 2000, we, the average human being, had an attention span of 12 seconds. Today, we have an attention span of eight seconds. And when we gave this talk, I can't remember when, we were, I think we were in Washington, D.C., and somebody came up afterwards and said to us, don't take this the wrong way, but I was like, there's absolutely no way it's eight seconds. And she goes, and then I found myself trying to answer an email and do something else. I wasn't even paying attention to what you all were saying. So she's like, you really kind of scared me there. But the reality is we are now behind goldfish in our ability to pay attention. So we're just dealing with, and before I hand it to Nathan to cover his, his idol, um, I wanted to just mention, I'm going to come back, but we have an environment, decreasing trust, decreasing happiness, and people not able to pay attention. So it's very hard to get our very important messages across, not the least of which is, what is the message of philanthropy? Yeah, and so you know, while the rise of, of corporate, corporate's ability to really uh, attract your attention, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, we see also things like this, and Brian always likes to tease me about uh, my Elon Musk um, thing, but last year, actually, Elon Musk was interviewed by uh, Chris Anderson at the TED organization, and he said these words, which I don't need to read because you can see them, but essentially going off and saying and defending that every one of his companies are philanthropy, and then essentially decided to restate what philanthropy was in case people didn't know it. So very, very conscious and aware attempt to say, you know, essentially, if you buy a Tesla, you're a philanthropist, which is what I put on LinkedIn, and still to this day is my the number one commented on LinkedIn post I've ever had. And what was interesting about it was really the the dichotomy of the responses. So lots and lots of people are saying this is absolutely atrocious. How dare him say this is philanthropy? This is you know sacrilegious. And then lots of other people, I assume, that didn't work in the nonprofit sector said. Absolutely, this is philanthropy, and why does it matter what a tax, a tax status is? And you know, at the end of the day, if I'm doing good, why is any of this bad? And so, really, this is the the world that we are working in, essentially, that where people are given lots of choices or are being told that they're giving lots of choices to do something that was only primarily done originally through a charitable institution. Tristan Harris, who is um, an early pioneer at Apple and Google. Uh, made the movie The Social Dilemma, if many of you saw it probably during COVID, a fantastic movie, and if you remember, he talks about this idea that social media and AI is essentially a race to the bottom of the brainstem. And that was pretty alarming because, you know, it's like essentially this wasn't designed for this, but essentially this a way to harvest attention so that it becomes so deeply embedded that you can get your three seconds of eyeballs on a product or a service. And he came out a few weeks ago um, in a new webinar, and he said, AI has advanced so much, the technology and the, the data around it has advanced so much that it's no longer a race to the bottom of the brainstem, it's a race to intimacy. And you know, for me, thinking about the word intimacy that I would almost entirely equate to nonprofits, I thought, oh my gosh, like this, is, this has been the moral high ground of nonprofits forever, is to create a, a really intimate space between a donor and an organization that is almost sacred, that essentially now the private sector is doing the exact same thing and at massive scale with lots of money and R&D behind it. And before I jump into the slide that's up here, the comment I was making was we were in front of a bunch of large not-for-profits um, presenting the results of our book and then having a dialogue. And one of them said, I think we're at the point where the next generation and the generation behind them doesn't care about the tax status of the organization. They want things resolved, they want society approved, they want change, and whoever does it will get their support. And it was a fascinating, coming from a chief development officer of a large not-for-profit, and it kind of confirmed a big part of our book, and so just a quick, my firm, Chinua Row, we help not-for-profits, but we also help corporations with their ESG, CSR, societal commitments. And it was in writing the book that I said to Nathan, I've got a little bit of a front row seat 
to watch corporations evolve. You know, there's great examples out there of companies that have been doing this for 40 years, but more and more they started understanding the, the value of values, our values matching to their values. And, and so as an example, you know, we put this mission, vision, and value statement up here. And when we started first talking about this, I would literally hear people in the audience be like, I think that's Greenpeace. They were whispering, referring to what was up here, thinking that it was a not-for-profit. And the reality is, these are the exact statements of Patagonia, Body Shop, and Ben and & Jerry's. And so I'm not here to say that these are some great companies here. It's just if you think about the moral high ground comment that Nathan made, and you think about the competition for connection and what I said about 15 minutes ago, you're no longer just competing with other nonprofits. Um, you're competing with companies who, who are looking and saying, we are doing some great things beyond selling a product. And so come sort of be a part of our journey, be a part of us, that we believe is one of the things that also is contributing to the, gener the crowding out effect, the generosity uh, crisis. And if you don't think that what they're doing is working, well, then you have to read the Edelman Trust Barometer. It comes out every year, and it looks at trust on the axis of ethical and competency. And so, no surprise, it's really small, I apologize. Not-for-profits not have always been the highest on the ethical. No surprise, I think, co companies have always been more so the leader on competency. But in the last three years al alone, companies have gone up 19 points on the ethical. 19 points. So they're, they're literally just about to bump into being, being equally seen as being ethical to not-for-profits. And then if we have a lower rating, which we do, on the competency, the combination of the two is what develops trust. And so if we're losing that trust battle, we're losing the very the moral high ground, we're losing the place that we once pr had by ourselves uh, because of the works that they're doing with their efforts, their marketing, their promotions, et cetera. But, um, you know, the quote that he had up there from Tristan about the race to intimacy, you know, the competition for connection was one of the big themes we write in the book. The other was a theme about radical connection. And Nathan sort of started going down this road talking about old-fashioned major gift work, really getting to know the donors, the people that are in your organizations. And we believe that that is actually the way out of the downward trend we're on. If we can get back to that, and I'll let Nathan begin to unpack what we mean by radical connection. And this is where we start taking the airplane back up. So you've heard the worst of it. So just to make sure you got through it, okay. You know, one of the things, and I feel weird now that Brian is standing up, I have to stand up. Um, one of the things that we really, um, I think it, it was revealed to us when we were writing the book was that what, really when it came down to this idea of trust and uh, lifetime value, life, uh, lifetime donors, is that it really came down to really understanding the depth of connection. It was not about whether someone was wealthy, it was not about a lot of other factors, it was about how deeply are their values aligned with our values, um, how, how well do they know us, and is that relationship bi-directional, not just, you know, I know you or you know me. So we actually had to come up with a new word, and I still don't know if it's the right word, but we, it needed to be something radical. So we came up with this idea of radical connection to say, you know what, nonprofits, we need to start thinking about connection as a primary way of what, things like how we evaluate our success. Um, do we evaluate things like how much money do we raise, or do we evaluate how many individuals, how many new individuals did we keep this year in terms of net increases in retention? And so a lot of work uh, needs to be done in this, this area. And what we did is we created, I think, oh, well, we, one more slide, there we go, it's like delayed. Yep. What we had to do is really create this framework to allow us to start thinking about the type of affiliation and association that used to be okay that we used to raise money doing you know, fairly well because we weren't competing against every for-profit and we, no one was using multi-channel and you know, trying to get you know, eyeballs on things, is that those strategies no longer work. So redefining what connection looks like really comes in this rubric, which is essentially what could be a donor survey. If you think about from the left to the right, and we'll cover just a couple of these, but are things like a mere preference versus something you love? And if you think about this um, from your own personal context, I happen to be a big Patagonia fan. I will go out of my way to go to a Patagonia store, whereas there's lots of other stores I like, and I will only visit if they're convenient for me. 
if I'm happy to be driving by. The same can be applied to nonprofits. Which are the nonprofits that when you, you give to and you talk about with your friends, you smile? Which ones strike that chord with you that go beyond just a mere preference or affiliation, but that you have a deep visceral connection with? Really, at the end of the day, um, the one that we really like the best is really gets down into this idea of I know you or you know me versus I know you and you know me. And so when we're talking about this idea of radical connection for nonprofits to prioritize relationships over revenue, it needs to be built in this idea that you're building a bi-directional relationship that has to really have mutual respect that has to, and we'll get into some practical tips here, but that really has to incentivize the relationship versus just the revenue alone. And this is a major, major shift for most nonprofits and how boards even evaluate nonprofits and how leaders keep their jobs. But at the end of the day, it's very rare for us to see a nonprofit that reports out on relationships ahead of revenue. Because for 50 or 100 years, that's how nonprofits have actually done this. We're talking about essentially flipping the pyramid to say, when we are evaluating our success for nonprofits, we are pr prioritizing the depth of relationship and, and above all, knowing that money comes. And so at the end of the day, this is what it looks like when we think about this access of how we're focusing on, and Brian and I were just talking at dinner last night, you know, if you thought about this through the lens that you gave an opportunity for your nonprofit to say, um, if for every donor that gives, if we don't steward your gift in a way that makes you feel like you are, you are part of our, you know, our family, that you felt thanked and stewarded, that we will give your money back in 30 days. In fact, we'll actually donate to any nonprofit that you want because you can't give it back because of the tax write-off. But we'll give it to any other nonprofit to your choosing in 30 days if we didn't make you feel like you were part of the family. I don't, does anyone do that in their organization? I mean, it's pretty amazing because if you think about, like, if we felt so strongly that we are prioritizing relationships that would stand the test of time with us and that were built on this idea of radical connection, we would have no problem doing that. And we would have built in processes and policies to essentially ensure that we are prioritizing the relationship versus taking a gift from an individual, moving on to the next individual because we had to fill the bucket for the year. So here we get down to just a real practical aspect. You know, there are a few essential ingredients. This is not rocket science. I think the biggest takeaway from our book for people, professionals in, in, in our community, came back and were like, we know this stuff intuitively. Somewhere we lost, the pendulum has swung so far to the transactional, and the need for philanthropy has outpaced really this ability to gain it. And so we've really had to make shortcuts and really kind of automate giving to this point. But really, you can't do this. There's no way you can create radical connection without really focusing on these things like vulnerability, authenticity, and inclusion, transparency and accountability. And really, at the end of the day, it's really going to be about this idea that this has to be an entire culture shift for an organization. This cannot happen with just one person. It can't happen even with a leader. If the board doesn't fully believe, understand what's at stake in the generosity crisis and where this all ends, if we don't do something radical to essentially change this. And as Nathan said, this is, and this is my favorite part of when we get into a Q&A, there's so many ideas that we've learned along the way from, from people in the audience of what are the practical implications of thinking about this. And as Nathan has said, I think now twice, there are, this, is, this is stuff if you've been in the industry for 18 months or 18 years or 38 years, it's fundamental to what I think we know, what we learned and, and what we were taught from some early parts of this. But, um, you know, some of the things that we go back to are some of the old school practical things, which is, you know, as an example, if, if, it, if, it, if you're not in front of the right person with the right ask, it's really not going to go very well. And beginning to understand that and beginning to understand, you know, begin tactics, you know, we've asked audiences to be really honest with us at a point like this and said, how many of you have either pushed a donor at the ask of a donor into the next fiscal year because it would be better for your records or you've been sped up an ask? of somebody because of your goals versus their goals. And you know, I won't do it here, but 75% of hands have gone up in many of the audiences we've been in front of. And it's just practical, simple things about beginning to think differently. Nathan loves to, which I think he's right, he loves to ask audiences, how many of you are on three-year rolling averages? Which is another practical tip or a suggestion 
to begin to allow the room to build in radical connection and to really breathe the ability to build true, open, transparent, vulnerable relationships. And usually what follows that is often people saying to us, our boards have to hear this. If our boards don't hear this, I can only go so far, which totally agreed. And, and I will tell you, having now gone in front of some boards with this very message, if they're honest, they say, actually, this mirrors what's happening in my industry. And what we're trying to do with my business, whatever sector they're in, they just, for some reason, show up at their not-for-profit board meetings and take off their hats and you know, think of it differently. When, when, and the reality is they can't because we're fighting the same different turbulent nature that we, they're fighting with their very businesses as well. And so one of the things, again, from a practical standpoint, to begin to challenge thinking, open up creativity and ways of doing this, is what happens if we were to start to prioritize relationships over money? Um, you know, Nathan, I don't know if you want to mention FarmLink and some of the work that you're, how you're beginning to change their function there. Yeah, and I know we need to speed up a little bit. Yep. But we, um, you know, I'm a part of a group called the FarmLink Project, and we've done this, actually. We really have looked at through the lens of what would it look like if we prioritized relationships over revenue? That means at a board meeting, we actually show the data that represents the net increases in retention over revenue. So it actually shows that first and then revenue second. Even a small nuance reframes the thinking of like what's really important. This idea of a three-year rolling average is something we did several years ago. It fundamentally changed our organization at City of Hope to allow us to work on essentially donor's timeline versus our timeline because we had our own individual goals and our, our, our corporate goals that we had to fill a bucket in one year. So we weren't speeding up or slowing down donors based on our timeline, but we were allowing the space to build those, those connections. There's very, it's very interesting, it's such an easy thing to do. Um, it, I mean, it took six months to do it, but easy in the sense of like not a complicated idea, but probably less than 5% of nonprofits actually use a three-year rolling average. And so this is just something that will actually fundamentally change how you are able to put relationships over revenue. Another practical thing is thinking about the database as a consultant, and I'm sure many of the consultants in the room, I hope, would agree, you know, for 20-something years, going in and looking at a client's database was done th mostly through the lens of the value, the, the potential, the financial. What if we flipped that on its head and really began to think about what are the data points that could talk to us about the health, the connection score, if you will, of the database, and how do we then move it to, that, to the quadrant that we had so we get to more people up into that upper right corner radical con con uh, connection? What are the characteristics of any given not-for-profit that the journey that you can bring people along is one that's true, that's authentic, that's vulnerable, that moves people up to the upper right? So only we'll cover like two minutes on AI, but essentially, um, and actually Benioff from Salesforce yesterday or the day before uh, was talking about Salesforce AI day that they just had and said, AI um, in generative AI is the mo most formative um, advancement that we've ever seen in our lifetime in probably any lifetime. And so our world is fundamentally shifted. Our world, you know, in the nonprofit sector, in the private sector, in our personal lives, and we are at the very cusp of this. About 2017, I really, when I started to believe this idea that giving was about connection, not about wealth, not about um, other um, data points that are highly biased in our industry and using wealth data, essentially, that has been largely built on uh, using data from rich white men, um, that has, is really a bad practice in our industry. So 2017, I started using machine learning to essentially look at experiential data, experiences in a hospital, like how well did they know us? And how did that knowledge of us and that understanding of us um, lead to them giving more and becoming better lifetime donors? And not surprisingly, we found out very quickly that a large majority of giving was related to essentially quantifying their connection to our organization. And so this is something that I've spent the last uh, five years on in doing, uh, really being an advocate for responsible AI that's been focused on uh, essentially removing as much bias as entirely possible using both humans and computers to essentially evaluate bias in real time um, to essentially get down to the heart of who are the people that really care about you because they are aligned with you in terms of their values. So here's where we're at. The reality is the world has shifted. The world has moved on. It is the eight of the 10 largest companies in the world are AI companies. The other two are highly vested in AI in terms of their practices. Most uh, for-profit companies are using three different versions of AI at any given time, but here's the reality. 89% of nonprofits feel like AI will make them more efficient. 
but only 28% have implemented or even experimented with it. We are just at this area in our sector that uh, essentially the haves and the haves nots will separate very quickly. Those essentially that are leveraging tools like the private sector uh, is leveraging to essentially build intimacy with you are going to be left out. And so we say this, uh, this thing commonly is that AI will not replace fundraisers, but fundraisers that use AI will replace those that don't. And if you think about this, two college students, one using AI and one not using AI, sitting side by side, the one using AI right now will complete their work faster at a higher quality. And frankly, um, data shows that they'll be happier because they offloaded some of the main mundane work than the other one. And so this is the idea of powering your organizations using the same technology that exists in the private sector. The reality is we have a long, long ways to go. I work with uh, over 100 organizations in building really sophisticated AI models. And at this, this point, I've realized that it's all about this, um, it's really about leadership's ability to understand the world and how it shifted, and this idea that we have to you know, really embrace a new way of doing business. We saw the trajectory, the downward trajectory, we know where it ends. It's, it's extremely, easy to just track that decrease. And if we are okay with living in a society that is less generous for our kids and our grandkids and other generations um, after us, then don't do anything. But at this stage, you know, we really have the tools and the technology and the affordability of the tools and technology to actually make a really big difference in our industry. So to kind of summarize and bring it home, and we'll certainly open it up to, to questions, um, a couple of steps here we wanted to just leave you with, takeaways, if you will. One is, going back to what Nathan said about 20-something minutes ago, beginning to think and, dare I say, adopted a mindset of that more is not necessarily better and getting away from that notion and really looking for, for the true relationships that you have with the, those people that are in your ecosystem. The second is challenging your views or biases on what is a connection versus affiliation. I think because for every not-for-profit, that will be different. And I think going through workshops and exercises what I find fascinating is when we, when we do some workshops and we ask people the question of what radical connection, what organization, for-profit or not-for-profit, do you think you have a radical connection with and why? And then take that back to your organization today. What, what could you learn from that? What are you experiencing from that organization that you could work to improve? Um, the second, we've said it multiple times, begin to look at the metrics that you're using. Um, because that's really important. The metrics that your board is asking of you, you're asking of yourselves, really drive behavior. Um, so let's begin to think about those data and metric points differently, a la, a la the FarmLink example. And as Nathan said, you'll start to see a change in even the questions, the conversations, and hopefully even the strategies that you put forward. And then really evaluate technology. Uh, really make sure it's working for you. As, as Nathan said it well earlier too, there's been a shift so much, I think, in the use of technology I think the pendulum's got to come back a little bit to bring the human element back into the great work that we're doing in order to secure the financial resources that are necessary. I'll only add to that because this technology is advancing so quickly now that um, I believe that responsible AI is everyone's responsibility. You're not all the same in terms of building models, but using models that every person has uh, the responsibility of understanding what is going in in what they're using essentially that AI should be explainable, essentially, for your organization. And so I lead an effort called fundraising.ai. It's completely independent. Um, if you go on LinkedIn and you just go to fundraising.ai, you can join about 1,100 other people that are really looking at how do we do this in our industry responsibly, um, that we can do things and use technology that fosters connection versus essentially creates more bias um, or essentially um, makes giving more transactional. So just in closing, some free resources we want to make you aware of. One is what we call conversation starters. If, if the very notion of talking about generosity, whether you believe there's a crisis or not, if you're talking about generosity, we're convinced nothing but good can come from that. So we have conversation starters for your team, for friends, et cetera, where, however you want to utilize that. The middle is the book club guide. We actually quickly developed one when we heard that there were groups uh, forming around and thought, let us just give you some of our framework for that you might want to consider. And then the last is a little bit of the 10 rules, the 10 laws of radical connection from what, from what we thought uh, back in November. But it's been great to interact with so many people and continue to build on other great suggestions and other great ideas. So 
Hopefully that was helpful. As I said in the beginning, we went on this journey, uh, Nathan and I together as friends and colleagues and put our heads together about two years ago and had the book come out about seven months ago. And it's been phenomenal to get to get in front of audiences like all of you and just appreciate the opportunity to share the, the message with you. So thank you. And yeah, thank you. So I think we have 10 minutes sure. for questions. And um, for the first three questions, you get a copy of the book. You come out after and get that. Um, we are happy to give that to you. And then I know we'll, we'll be over at the bookstore after as well. Sure. So, And as Brian said, please connect with us. We feel like this is something that is a, a responsibility back to our industry. And only together are we going to solve this. So, um, there's, uh, I think. Yes, you've got your hand right there. Yes, with the black mask on. I saw your hand went up like right at the beginning, so kudos. So, yeah, the question. Um, yes, thank you. So the question was, what are some of those KPIs that you can use to um, essentially prioritize connection? You know, some of those that we think about very easily um, are around retention, to be honest. So like, it's, it's not very hard. It's interesting, when we talk about lifetime uh, value of donors, that most often that, that term, LTV, is really only used, or long-term value of donors, only used in the direct response world, uh, which is a little ironic. And so I think at the end of the day, uh, for organizations that are prioritizing KPIs that are related to how many people in your portfolio did you start out with, how many people did you end with, knowing that at the end of the day, if you're given the right relationships to foster um, based on you know, all the signs and their connection to you, that you will have increased not only the number of people and your incentives will be built on fostering the relationship versus at the end of the day, I just tried to fill my, fill my goal at any cost. I led fundraising teams for 20 years and at the end of the day, I, I knew this was happening is that a gift officer would ask for a gift and because of their KPIs were largely focused on money, that they, would, had, they had no incentive, really frankly zero incentive to continue to foster a relationship for 12 months. So in 12 months, of course, they would surface back on their radar. And we share this in the book, but the worst thing that I've ever had a donor, which still haunts me and horrifies me, and it's a donor that I absolutely love, and I think because we had trust that he was able to tell me this, and he said, why is it the only time that I hear from you is when you want more money? And man, that, that hurt. Like, I mean, it still hurts, and that was years ago. And so that's really the idea of creating KPIs that, in, that prioritize for your entire organization net increases in, in retention and relationships. Right here in front. So I'm curious, you've just come out when we'll be onto the Philly crisis of the pandemic. Oh, great. So the last, since 2020, winter 2020, we all lived through a pandemic, the single greatest impacting crisis of our generation. What influences do you think that has had on this study, on all studies. I mean, it's dramatically changed because technology moved at an incredible pace during that period as well. So I'm curious to know if you've had any thought on that as well, because many organizations, including my, eye, my own, are still in crisis mode. Mm -hmm. I, don't think, I don't think I need to repeat it since he was able to use the microphone, but I would say that um, it's a great question. The, you know, what we used to say internally at, at my firm about the Great Recession, 0809, was that there was a depressionary mindset that people had about a recession. And the data was such that you could, you know, I mean, you can, but most people experienced such a drop in whatever value they had, whatever assets they had in terms of the value of them. It was so stark and so quick. I think upwards of like 65, 70% of some folks' overall net assets were just gone in however short period of time. And that depressionary mindset um, lingers a long time after the fact. And that was the point that we were trying to, to get across to our clients and working with them that, yes, the economy in 11 and 12 came back, but the psychological aspect didn't. Um, and I think that's one of the early slides I touched on that we still never recovered from. And so now taking it back to the question in the, the pandemic, I think that is again happening, this notion of the trauma of going through that um, while technology has moved, as you said, about the sp has speed, it just has everybody's heads, I think, spinning around about what the, my jobs are no longer the same. I, you know, the, and I was saying to our teams the other day, 
who are stressed out about the use of technology and how to incorporate it. And I said, think about, for us, think about if we're this way, what, what's this, what is the challenges that our clients are feeling? I mean, going in and consulting with them and leading with empathy, I think, is going to be the most important thing for us all. Because although the, the pandemic may be behind us, um, let's hope it is, I think we're going to have that lingering effect for maybe a decade or more of this fear of what we just went through. The, you know, the, the, and, and it only, in my opinion, reinforced the trust and the happiness and the loneliness issues that we're already dealing with. Um, it just reinforced that. And I've got four relatively young kids, and to see how they've gone through it, ups and downs, um, and to see technology's influence on them and all those things, I mean, I'm quite frankly worried about how they'll be over the next couple of years coming out of the pandemic. We tried to, our best to give them a normal period through it all, but you know, you just do the best you can, and I think that's the end of result for organizations as well. I, I would only add to that real quick is that you know when we we looked at the data from the pandemic time, the organizations that did well versus you know def definitely winners and losers. There was a moment in time where there was net increases in total giving, and there was this glimmer of hope is that somehow like people had realized that they were part of something bigger than themselves, and they were they were able to to come together and feel like they could you know, do something and, and kind of control things by coming together. And the shame of that is because there are a lot of organizations that were not prepared at all to even thank their donors, even in a basic way. And so this idea that we were able to like really bring a lot of new people um, that had probably never ever given ever and, and bring them into the fold and then not thank them and I, I, there were several gifts I made that I was not thanked for. And I'm much more forgiving of that being in the sector. But at the end of the day, someone who's trying out philanthropy that did that doesn't feel good. And so I think there could have also been harm done you know, by organizations that, frankly, were not prepared and were not really incentivized in the right way. All right, you, you pick, Brian. It's hard to see. Uh, Yes, yeah, way in the back right corner, my right corner. <laughs> you had an advocate, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so how did the three-year rolling average shift the budgeting process um, within our organization? You know, it, gosh, I'm, I'm trying to even remember why. Um, I, I think I know why that we, we did this. So a year before, um, it was the day before the fiscal year closed, and I was, I literally, I think it was like 10 o'clock at night, I was traveling somewhere, and I get a call from the healthcare C CFO saying, you know, is this money going to come in? Is it is it here? This is the last day, and everyone's bonuses are dependent on this and the enterprise. And it was just such a bad taste in my mouth, and it's just a just a really really bad idea. Is that we came back and we're like, okay, no more. Like this has to completely shift. You know, one is we're not doing right by our donors because we're essentially telling all gift officers that their bonuses are only based on money they bring in this year. Um, that from a finance perspective, that because giving is, is not on a straight line, giving is like this and this, and depending on you know, high net worth individuals, they might give you know, every three years or two years, is that when we looked at the data and we started basically doing a, a prototype of a three-year rolling average, finance actually became the biggest advocate because it made the budgeting process more stable. So for them, it actually solved this issue of like, you know, not this like, this really hyped up, like, are we going to get there? But, you know, we planned ahead basically lose, using a little bit more longitudinal data. So actually, I think finance became the biggest proponent of it um, because it helped them predict revenue better. Um, and then, of course, from the philanthropy team, huge, huge difference because, you know, the behavior of I'm trying to push a donor, like, really, really hard, and, and leaders are trying to push a staff member to push a donor really hard to fill the bucket because fiscal year is going to close in two weeks versus let's allow us to focus on the relationship first, knowing that we're evaluated on this three-year rolling average, and therefore um, it, it actually was probably the most transformative thing I've done in my career. Yeah, so how do you, you know, from a major gifts perspective, how do you scale this, right? And so this is truly really what AI does. And so I, I don't think there is a way to scale. In fact, when we, there's a chapter in our book that we never wrote, which is like, how do you, you know, essentially, you know, what is the replacement for, you know, a disassociation religion? Or what is the replacement for, you know, people feeling disfranchised? There really 
there are not replacements for that. You know, one of the interesting things is GoFundMe processes one transaction per second 24-7. They now are, uh, well, GoFundMe owns Classy. It's actually, they have data to show that people are onboarding in philanthropy through GoFundMe because a, a neighbor helping a neighbor or things like that actually can become better lifetime donors. All that is really through the use of technology. When, I, when we think about truly scale, the only way to do more, so as a gift officer, you know, I always knew that I could only go to lunch with, well, I technically could eat more than one lunch a day, but it would, it would be you know, kind of impractical. I, I always knew I could have lunch with one person every day. So it really needed to be the right person. So at scale, when we're talking about measuring connection of a person through AI that is not based on you know, their race, it's not based on their wealth, it's not based on lots of other factors that are highly biased in our industry, that I could have lunch with the right person. And, and this is true because we, I got a call from a major gift officer um, at a children's hospital who said, I've, in all my career, fundraising 20 years, I've never closed more gifts faster at a higher average dollar. Only by essentially using this idea of measuring connection versus a, what our, most of our industry does is measures wealth. And so I think getting free from this idea that wealth equates philanthropy and truly from a data science perspective, wealth is less than 10% indicative of whether someone actually would ever make a gift. So no matter how wealthy you are, less than 10% um, indicative of whether you'd ever make a gift. And so I think we have to free ourselves from those chains that most organizations have really succumbed to for so long. Would you say that statistic again? That wealth, is, wealth alone is less than 10% indicative of whether or not a person would make a charitable gift. Yet about 90% of nonprofit organizations use wealth as a primary indicator of whether someone's a good or bad prospect. So we, we have to completely free ourselves from that notion. Um, in the back, right. Oh, we, sorry. I think that's the last one. Are we one. done? Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's the last one, okay, the last one. Oh, yeah, we're two minutes over. Yeah, yeah the question's fundamentally about the, the value of collaboration amongst cross sectors vis a vis the competition for connection. I, I'm a massive fan of collaboration um, within my own holding company. We've, we've got about 15 agencies all working together on projects for not for profits. I, I'm a big believer of, you know, we, we all have a part or a piece of the wisdom, but getting, getting others, other organizations, other people around the table, we complete the full picture of the, the wisdom that's out there. So I'm a big uh, supporter of it, and actually the data shows, which is why corporates are so interested in partnering with all of you, the lift they would get from collaborating with not-for-profits to that very value slides I was talking about uh, was significant, and uh, hence the explosion of cause marketing, which is evolving, in my opinion, thankfully, uh, to something that's more authentic. But the, the collaborative nature and the halo effect that both sides usually pick up in the perception, but also in what they're developing, to me, is significant. And so I would much prefer it be that. Um, the point in our book was just to wake up everybody to the fact that we're your mind share is being bought and traded and sold and trying to be better positioned every day. And so just that the not-for-profits need to just be aware of it because we're never going to be able to compete, as Nathan said earlier, with the R&D budgets. But to be mindful of it, I think, might open up some other solutions as well. Awesome. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you, thank you everyone.